Well, welcome, everybody. We're, we're making a, a transition here. Uh, this, this day is on international engagement, and this morning we heard a lot about international engagement in large science, which, of course, occupies a lot of physics. But uh, now we're going to make a transition to international engagement in very competitive areas. And uh, one of the uh, most uh, important uh, for physics that has uh, been rising very fast, of course, is quantum information science. And so uh, the, we'll, we'll, we'll start with uh, the keynote given by one of the leaders in that area, uh, Chris Monroe. So let me tell you a little bit about Chris. Chris is a distinguished university professor at the University of Maryland, and he's also a fellow at the Joint Quantum Institute, which is a joint because it's between the University of Maryland and NIST. Uh, and uh, it uh, concentrates in uh, many areas of quantum science, including quantum information science. Um, Chris uh, is a, a graduate of uh, MIT. Uh, he got his PhD from the University of Colorado in, in Boulder, one of the great AMO physics institutions in the country. Uh, he's the recipient of uh, many prizes. He's, he's uh, won the Robbie Prize, the Shallow Prize, and the Willis Lamb Prize. And you know that's quite a trifecta in AMO physics. Uh, so it shows he's been doing things that the community um, really benefits from and really appreciates. He's also um, a, a, starter, a, a founder of a startup company, um, IonQ, uh, which is in the quantum information space. And he's going to uh, talk to us uh, today about quantum information science and its role as a very competitive activity on the international stage. So please welcome Chris Monroe. Thank you, Phil. Um, in fact, I owe Phil a lot more than he realizes. Um, I remember a plane trip when we were both in Ann Arbor on the faculty at the University of Michigan. We came down here for some lobbying event. I forgot what it was. But um, I, I saw him work, work a room f full of a uh, uh, few Congress, uh, Congress uh, men and women and, and their staffers. But on the, on the flight back to Michigan, I also got um, less scared of using pulse lasers in my own research uh, due, due to him. So I really thank you. That really revolutionized a lot of the stuff that I do. Um, so the topic today, uh, broadly speaking, is international you know, op open science and physics and also competition. And indeed, this is one of the areas that um, has, it, it's really um, competition on steroids in this field. And part of what I hope you gain uh, from, uh, from, from my remarks are that we still really don't know what this stuff's good for. Um, so in, in a sense, it's very beautiful and, and, and this, this field really needs to be couched in science. Nevertheless, there are big and small companies involved uh, building things that we don't know what they're going to do. So it's, it's a, a rather interesting journey. Uh, and, and I've seen both sides of, of things. And I, uh, I'm proud to have successfully gone back to my, uh, uh, my full-time job at the university. So INQ is a startup that I, I co-founded with Jung Sang Kim from Duke University about three or four years ago. Uh, we're about 100 people now. Uh, in College Park, uh, just about five minutes away from APS headquarters there. Um, and uh, I, I spend a few hours a week there now, um, and it's, it's beautiful seeing all the, I mean, there are very few quantum trained people at INQ, maybe about a, a quarter of them are, 20%. But the engineering aspect of building devices, even when we don't know what they're going to do, <laughs> um, uh, make, makes it very fun. So this is a picture of 18, I, Shoot, I should have counted before. Uh, about 20 individual atoms. They're all individual ytterbium atoms. Each of them is a very good atomic clock, actually, and we use, we use a lot of the features of atomic clocks to, uh, uh, to promote the idea of this being pretty much the leading platform to build a quantum computer. And I'll talk a little bit broadly about what that is. You've probably heard a little bit about that. Um, just real quickly, the, the, the spacing between these atoms is only a few microns, but we can focused individual lasers. Obviously, we can resolve them optically. The atoms are really cold. They're about 1,000 times smaller than you see. This is just the diffraction limit of our optics, and it's not perfect, as you can also see. Um, but this is a real sort of time movie. They sit there all day, and this is uh, because they're absolutely identical. 
I mean, they're atomic clocks. They define what identical means. Um, so in a sense, while we don't think of this as being a super easy platform to scale to large, really large numbers of qubits, um, it has the fundamental ingredients that no other technology has to scale. And that is being able to replicate nearly perfectly. So AML physics will, I think as soon as the big companies realize this, they'll be jumping into this technology in a big way. So as, as, as some background in the field, um, I, th I think as, as physicists, most of us are pretty well steeped in the concepts of quantum physics, as strange as they are, at least we're comfortable using them. But information theory is something uh, I had to learn pretty, much, pretty late in my life. Um, and these, these two characters should be sort of heroes to, to, to us physicists because they abstracted information into things that could be represented by anything physical. But the point, the point is, if you want to store information, you have to use physics. There has to be some physical way to do that. Turing, for his part, invented this abstract notion of a computer based on a tape that moves across a head. Some interactions here. Um, and th this is not a real machine. It's an abstract idea. But you can go ahead and build it out of many different types of hardwares. Shannon, uh, on the more mathematical side, and his colleagues at Bell Labs invented the concept of a bit, the fundamental unit of, unit of information, the zero and one. And uh, the, the, the Shannon entropy, which has close ties to thermodynamic entropy, allowed us to consider information content, coding, error correction, things like this. And of course, in bits, we look for physical systems that can represent the bits. And at the time, the state of the art was vacuum tubes, which were at least they sort of worked. They weren't so reliable. You could put several thousand of them into machines like these here um, based on these vacuum tubes. I, again, I'm, uh, this, this predates most of us, uh, but they weren't so reliable. They broke a lot. Um, and so scaling up to many millions of them was pretty much a non-starter. But of course, the beautiful, everybody knows this picture from the 40s. It's a physics picture of the first solid state transistor based on uh, germanium. Uh, a gold germanium junction here, uh, at where, where a current through the gate here controls the current going, the maybe much larger current uh, going from the source to the, uh, uh, to the drain. So this is a physics experiment, but because it's solid state, it has had the potential for being much more reliable, and of course we know the rest is history. Maybe uh, uh, if you all know about Moore's law, uh, I would say it's based on the fact that we invented technologies in solid state physics that allowed us very large scale integration of VLSI. This particular version of Moore's Law is only for the last few decades where we still enjoyed this exponential growth, factor of, factor of 10 every decade or something like that, but we see signs already of it starting to saturate and this is simply because the transistors are just getting too small. They're getting so small they're approaching molecular size scales and you know, there are interesting effects there. It's very hard to control a big macroscopic hunk of something at the microscopic level like that. Well, you've probably seen this wonderful speech of Richard Feynman uh, printed uh, at an APS meeting in 1959. There's plenty of room at the bottom. And he was, of course, one of the founders of, of quantum electrodynamics, but he liked to tinker, as we know. And I think he was, he was really struck by the, the fact that there were solid state transistors and they could be miniaturized, even down to individual molecules. And he had this zinger in this paper that really hinted at something more to come here, and that is when you have circuits designed out of individual atoms, they behave nothing like, you know, they, they behave according to a different law of physics, so there should be new opportunities for design. This was, this was um, almost 80 years ago. <laughs> um, and, and I think by, by now we, we understand that, that opportunity is called quantum information science. The fact that we, we can use different physical law to maybe um, help the problem of this lack of growth from the classical Moore's law. So that, that's a little bit optimistic, I would say. We, like I think I said at the outset, we're still not sure how this will play out. But there are some um, simple ways of understanding how quantum information systems work, quantum computers in particular. And uh, these opportunities are that quantum systems can be in states of superposition. So bits can be not just in definite states, but they can be in these confused superposed states of zero and one, and the weightings between zero and one can be controlled from the outside world. And the real strange part of quantum, of course, is the fact that it's not the wave part. That's sort of pedestrian, if you're familiar with differential equations. 
the strange part of quantum is the measurement problem, where when we look at its superposition, it randomly picks one or the other state. And that's, that's the revolutionary law of quantum, I think Feynman is referring to here. Uh, it requires probabilities from the ground floor, like no other theory in all of nature. It seems to imply that by observing something, we affect that something. So these are the weird laws of quantum, and there's all kinds of philosophy books written about them. But like I said, as physicists, we're at least um, comfortable with using these laws. And the laws are straightforward. So to build a quantum computer out of bits, the, the interesting thing that happens is as you put bits together, the number of possibilities that you can store in superposition grow exponentially. Right? With one bit, there are two states. With 10 bits, there are 1,000 states. Two to the 10th is about 1,000. So every time you add a bit, you've, in a sense, doubled the power, I put it in quotes, of your quantum system. So there's an inherent Moore's law there. Just add one bit, and you've doubled the system. Every year, we just have to add one atom. That doesn't seem too hard. OK. <laughs> so but th th this probably was realized even back in 1959. But one thing that wasn't realized was how to, how to, make, this, how to make use of all these exponential possibilities, because when you measure a big quantum system, you get randomness, you get noise. So I like to say that quantum computing at a very high level is a good news, bad news, good news story. And I told, already told you some of the good news. We can do parallel computing. With three qubits, there are eight states, and they have eight weightings here. And these A parameters follow a wave equation. That's where all the math is. Um, and we can get eight answers. Now, eight is pretty trivial. We can do that, on, we can do that calculation on any classical computer, of course. But with 300 qubits, just 300 atoms, 2 to the power of 300 is more than the number of particles in the universe. So that's the magic of exponential. I mean, nobody's wowed here. This is more for a non-physicist <laughs> audience. But uh, you know, getting access to those 2 to the 300 uh, 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 pieces of data is the subtle thing. And of course, the bad news is, even with just 3 qubits, when you measure the output of this beautiful parallel processor, you get only one answer, and it's random. So it's as though you had no idea what the input was. So a one-to-one -one function is probably not going to work very well in a quantum computer. And most of what we compute today is our one-to-one -one functions. So keep that in mind. The final piece of good news, I would say, was codified by many folks, including David Deutsch. And I see Charlie Bennett's in the audience, including he, he thought long and hard about entanglement before it was fashionable. Um, and these, these founders in the 80s and 90s showed that there can be quantum interference that can occur. And this quantum interference is very hard to draw here. I've, I tried to depict it with these orange dots. And these blue things are supposed to be waves. Um, and and what, what can happen is uh, uh, you can get massive interference where all the answers cancel, except one or maybe a few, but not exponentially many. And then when you measure it, and you may have to do it a few times, not exponentially many times. Uh, and when you have 300 qubits, there are, you know, there's no way to deal with all, all, all of those inputs. And the quantum computer, the magic is in these gates, these operations that do not measure. They just interference. And then when you measure the output, uh, in some algorithms, that can depend on all these inputs. That's the trick. And it's very vague because I think, as I hinted earlier, there are not so many applications you know, that work here. Well, the killer app has been known for almost uh, 25 years now, 25 or 30 years, and it does hit on the topic of security, and it probably underlies why quantum computing uh, is so important to many governments throughout the world. Well, that application is factoring numbers. Factoring, uh, classically, um, nobody's proven this, but we believe that factoring is exponentially hard in the size of the input. And uh, factoring numbers, while it might seem esoteric, is, of course, the reason why data is secure, according to many very simple, remarkably simple uh, encryption algorithms, including the RSA algorithm, Rivas Shamir Edelman. Um, and the idea is, uh, well, there's, it's, a, it's beautiful mathematics. It's about two lines. But when you, uh, when you want to send a secret, you're making public a huge number that nobody can factor because it has 1,000 digits. Um, and we're relying on the hardness of factoring. Peter Shore. This watershed event in the mid-90s, he showed that a quantum computer, if built with perfect operations and perfect quantum behavior, would be able to factor large numbers in sub-exponential time, actually polynomially with, with the input. Now, truth be told, the polynomial scaling is not great. It goes like the cube of the number of bits. So if you have a 1,000-bit number, 
you need about a billion, actually there's a prefactor, it's a thousand times the number of bits cubed. So if you have a thousand bit number, you need about a trillion operations. And that implies that you need a part per trillion errors on each individual operation. And that's why none of us, maybe there are some folks up in Fort Meade, they're, they're still thinking about this, but none of us are really worried about Shor's algorithm uh, happening tomorrow. Maybe in 30 years, who knows? Who, who, who can predict anything in 30 years? Um, but, but this is a long-term problem. And the way it works, and again, this is really high level, um, the way it works is when you encode the number that you want to factor, like 39, into a quantum computer, you're going to need at least um, six bits to do this, because two to the sixth is, is uh, 64. And you store a superposition, and you do Shor's prescription, and you end up with a quantum wave function that's just a superposition of these two numbers, and then you measure it, and you get one of the factors. That's a very high-level view of how Shor's algorithm works. But it points to one of the commonalities of all quantum computations, and that is they produce a simple answer from a maze of combinations. Classically, factoring a big number, you basically have to test all the prime numbers up to the cube root of the number at hand. So, um, yeah, I, I, I want to pause here because this application is interesting. Is it's, it, you can prove that a quantum computer can do this problem fast. Now, notice that we still can't prove that a classical computer um, cannot do it fast, but it's strongly thought that's, that that's the case. But this is one of the few examples in quantum computing where we have a hard proof that it will work. Of course, we have to build it. It, it, it comes down to building machines to do, to do something, and it's, it's one of the most difficult problems you could imagine on a quantum computer. So there's a good and bad about this. It's the bad is really hard. The good is that we have clear proofs that quantum computers are good for something. Now, there's another set of applications that only in the last 10 years or so have started uh, to become interesting. Um, and the very good news is that this is a type of problem that is much more widespread than factoring or security. It's optimization. I mean, if you had to come up with a problem that has lots of inputs but only one answer, you would probably say, well, optimization problems are like that because there's one optimum answer. What's the tallest peak in this two-dimensional two -dimensional landscape? Well, it's right here. We can just see that because there's only two variables. A, you know, a latitude and a longitude. But if I give you a function with 10,000 variables, um, finding the optimal value of those variables that minimizes some nonlinear cost function is really hard. In fact, as a society, we tend to ignore those problems or we invent, we invent approximations, heuristics. So it's a, it's, it, there's beautiful classical computing that attacks these types of problems, but there are no proofs behind them. They're heuristics. Now, um, the bad news is Applying quantum computers to optimization, it's a, it's a research field onto its own right now. And I don't think anybody believes that a quantum computer can actually solve for the optimum of some complicated function. Uh, however, it may be able to approximate that, uh, that optimum better than any classical computer. Again, it will be a heuristic. And maybe classical computers will be better, and then, then it'll be a leapfrog. So uh, there's a lot of promise. And, What's great about optimization is that it hits everything. Any company in the world that has more than 20,000 employees probably has people thinking about quantum computing, what it can do for them. But uh, again, it's a, it's a very researchy field. A lot of these companies, their interest in quantum computing is defensive. Everybody else is doing it, so we better do it. So you have to, you have to really, really be careful about that. But as an experimentalist, I'm, I'm an AMO experimentalist, um, I, I love the state of these affairs because we really need to build these machines and get them in the hands of users. Because I'm not going to figure out the application, but some user, some software developer who might have read the laws of how quantum gates work, if they can get access to these machines, I think that's really where the growth of the field will come. And in terms of uh, uh, optimization, of course, we don't usually think of molecules doing optimizations, but the electrons on those molecules have a combinatorial number of configurations. And they, due to the laws of quantum mechanics that they follow, they automatically optimize it. They find their minimum energy. And that's called the binding energy of a molecule. But a molecule even as simple as, as uh, caffeine, I think that's caffeine, yeah, uh, it has about 100 electrons or so. That's still beyond the reach of classical computers to find the ground state. We have beautiful heuristics that approximate. Of course, we can measure it in simple molecules like that. This one here is a very important molecule. It's a, it's a nitrogenase that we know uh, that bacteria uses to fix nitrogen, to break N2 into ammonia. 
which sounds esoteric, but uh, again, as a physicist, when I learned this, I was astounded that many percent of the world's energy is used to do that in a very hot and high pressure process called the Haber process. We don't understand how bacteria is able to do it, and it, we think it has something to do with these funny, you know, molybdenum and iron core in, the, in this big organic. So understanding the structure of this uh, is interesting, and, and I, I'm also amazed that Microsoft has a big and probably the most um, capable team in the world that's looking at this molecule be, uh, and, and trying to map it to a quantum computer. And then, you know, logistics problems, there's no shortage of these problems that we tend to ignore or, or approximate, like, uh, the traveling salesman problem, again, these problems blow up when you, when you add numbers of inputs. So now I want to switch over to technology. I think I set the stage that we really need to build these things to see what they're good for. And my colleague Bill Phillips um, at NIST, at, in, at JQI in College Park, he's fond of saying that, that a quantum computer differs more from your laptop than your laptop differs from an abacus. And what he means here is that these two computers really f are both Turing machines, abstractly. They, they follow the same rules of compute. One's a lot faster than the other, of course. Um, but, but these two, they don't follow the same rules. And I think the corollary to this is, um, why should we expect quantum computers to look anything like laptops? And I'll even be more pointed. Why should we expect quantum computers need to be based in silicon or solid state? Maybe. But that's actually a horrible place to do really clean quantum mechanics if you want to scale. Every single transistor in your processor is different by almost a factor of two, and it doesn't matter because you get to use feedback. In quantum, you don't have that uh, possibility, and you really need standards, and that's, I think, why atoms are going to play a big role. I've been talking almost exclusively about computing, but the idea of using qubits and quantum information, there are some old ideas here, but there are are roughly three pillars of what we call quantum information science. Um, simulation and computing, but also communication. Uh, I didn't point this out, but um, if, if you really want to get around uh, quantum decryption, you can always use quantum mechanics to encrypt, to store data in superpositions, and that way if somebody's eavesdropping, you can fundamentally tell if they're eavesdropping. Um, that's one kind of killer app. I say kind of because if you're a professional and you really want to spy on somebody, you tend not to go halfway in between sender and receiver. You look behind the sender and watch what they're typing <laughs> or, or the receiver. That's what I'm told by, by, uh, by fo folks up the road there. Um, so so <laughs> quantum, quantum encryption itself, uh, it's interesting, but it's a little bit of an esoteric thing. However, quantum communication, if you have many nodes and you can share entangled states, there's, this is active research. There may be protocols where you can you can have secure voting. You, you can decide things where you don't trust everybody, things like this, based on laws of entanglement. Uh, to me, these are sort of tied together uh, at the hardware stage, because um, even with atoms, if you want to scale to large, huge systems, they're, they're going to have to be modular, very much like multi-core processors. We're going to have to communicate quantum bits over a distance. It might be across the lab or across the chip. It might be, uh, uh, it might be across the country. So these, the technologies for these two areas are very similar. Quantum sensing is something that um, I would say, is, in a sense, has already arrived. We have sensors that have quantum limited noise floors. And even below that, I think David Rizzi this morning talked about how there is quantum uh, mechanics at use in the LIGO, in the advanced LIGO source, where they're using squeeze states to, to get below the shot noise limit. And even though it's only a factor of two or three, it allows you to look much further into the universe for gravitational wave sources. Those ideas um, are closely tied to quantum information. There's certainly a linkage there. So since Shore and leading into the 2000s, um, this, this area has, of course, exploded, certainly theoretically. And this is a count, it's a few years old now, on the number of papers per year in these fields, and, and they're growing substantially. Um, I, I dug this out um, in talking with uh, Phil a few weeks ago, that uh, th there's a famous paper following up Einstein's uh, EPR paper in 35, John Bell uh, 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 had the idea that there's a mathematical identity that you can, that you can show that, that uh, makes entanglement seem even weirder in a sense, that even if there's a completion to quantum mechanics that doesn't have this spooky action at a distance, there's still going to be non-locality. And they're, they're codified in terms of a Bell inequality that he pointed out in this paper. And this is the number of citations of his paper over the years, and this is a log plot of the same. 
So uh, you could argue whether it's starting to saturate, but this is a Moore's Law of citations. I don't think there's any other paper that, that has grown over many decades with a constant exponential. Kind of interesting. Okay, um, so g getting into the laboratory, you know, there are many quantum systems that we could think of to build these, these types of hardwares, quantum computers and so forth. Um, anything that any lab that needs to use quantum entanglement or many body physics to study their system is sort of a candidate to think about building devices out of. I would say, however, that the, the, the two at the top here, uh, shaded in red, are only the ones so far that have been built into systems, meaning that these are systems sort of like a Turing machine where we can think about abstracting away the hardware and unleash the power of these devices, even though they're very small still, to programmers, people who know applications. And a lot of these other um, uh, platforms, they're still in the research stage, uh, some more promising than others. Uh, I would say topological qubits in particular, it's very researchy, but it's beautiful condensed matter physics, the idea that a qubit can be stored in a different space in the topology of, of, of a circuit, uh, and there's wonderful research going on in all of these fields. But I would say these two are currently being built into systems composed of dozens of qubits, which embarrassingly is still, still pretty small, but dozens is better than one or two. And if you're building dozens, you're getting an idea how to scale. You're learning that the, you know, the, the, the whole system is more than just the sum of its parts, and those are two technologies that are being developed, not surprisingly, at many companies, some very big companies here. Um, even, even the Atoms I'll talk about a little bit, uh, our, our, our little startup, and also Honeywell has gotten on the scene. So um, the, the real problem, I would guess, with, with, with atomic physics and in, in, in industry, and that applies to the trapped ions, maybe even diamond vacancies in, in, uh, in, uh, in sorry, NV vacancies in diamond, which is an interesting sort of solid state atom, and neutral atoms, and even photonics, is that the laboratories to support these, they're, they're laboratories, that's the problem. They're, these are not, this doesn't look like a system. And in fact, all of the action is taking place in a, in, a, you know, in, a, in a cubic foot right here. There's a vacuum chamber and an ion trap and individual atoms are in there. Almost all of the hardware, and those of us in AMO physics recognize tables like this, most, most of us put this uh, slide like, like this up here and say, wow, look at me, isn't this amazing? I'm really embarrassed by this, this is horrible. It's very hard to make progress in something like this. Well, the good news is, like any system, if you know what you want to build, you don't need every little mirror to have three screws on it. You can, uh, you, you can hardwire things if you know what you want to build. So we've been on a journey over the last many years to do that, but building a small system in the lab, I mean, everything starts from, from the physics laboratory, and uh, building a, a, a small system of only a few qubits has been, uh, has been very interesting over the last few years. It's changed my outlook on doing physics. I, used, I, I still am an atomic physicist, but I'm not learning much about atomic physics anymore. I'm learning about high-level physics that we can do by putting together many qubits and controlling them. Um, these students, they can calibrate the system in the morning, and then they can run the system for several hours without knowing they're doing atoms, they're, they're doing quantum circuits. Um, so, th so of these many applications, these were mostly done with collaborators who said, do you know you can do this with your system? Oh, I had no idea about that. Um, and this is the kind of physics that I find fascinating because I'm now in school again learning about all kinds of things. One of my favorites is uh, an experiment uh, we did a few years ago um, having to do with the scrambling of quantum information. And quantum scrambling, you may have heard this term in the last few years, it's something that's thought to occur in black holes. If you put, inform if you put a bit into a black hole, it's sort of, gets scrambled really fast, meaning that the information gets lost. Or does it get lost? Because we know black holes evaporate, and it may be that the Hawking radiation can be correlated with one part of an entangled system, an entangled pair that you, that you throw into the black hole. And even more recently, it's been posited that entanglement uh, could uh, allow us to at least toy with theories of quantum gravity and even wormholes. And a wormhole allow is, is sort of, uh, the connection between entanglement and wormholes is really profound. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm not even a graduate student in, in, in some of these areas, but they're, you know, they're fantastic. And folks like Maldacena and Lenny Susskin and John Preskill and Patrick Hayden have put, put these things together. Well, another reason I like to point this experiment out is that uh, Norm Yao here is in the audience and he will receive the value prize th this evening. Um, and he's one of my favorite collaborators because he calls us up. It may take up to a year to be convinced, but he calls us up, oh, you really should do this, you really should do this. And this was one of them. He said, oh, you can, do you can detect scrambling. And I, I won't go into too many details here, but we, we made a seven-qubit circuit 
And what we're doing, uh, again, lower, lower your sights, we're, we're testing whether a three-bit unitary scrambles or not. So in a sense, we're, we're doing black hole physics with three qubits. I, you know, I, I, should, I can't say that with a straight face, but the idea of scrambling, having a litmus test for scrambling is really hard to do. Um, and Norm and Benny Yoshida from Perimeter and other theorists showed that if we implement this circuit, you entangle a bunch of qubits, put them through some unitary, it can be any unitary, uh, and depending on certain measurements here, if that unitary scrambles, this arbitrary input state, all the others are zeroed, it will be teleported, or it will be copied. I shouldn't say copy, we can't copy. If you, if, if you copy the state, you have to erase the original at the same time. The no cloning theorem, and Charlie Bennett here, and who knows very well about that, and, and in a sense is the inventor of the teleportation concept itself. And sorry, Charlie, it's a weird term, teleportation, because people think of Star Trek, but it's a perfect term in terms of sort of the disembodied movement of information from one place to another. That's exactly what it is at a single qubit level. And uh, if this teleports, then U scrambles. And I won't get into the details of what we implemented for U. It's, it was a variable circuit that we knew would scramble for certain parameters and wouldn't at other, and you know, Norm showed us the circuit to do. We implemented it, and it kind of worked. Um, uh, if you're above 50%, the teleportation is, you can show that the, the teleportation can be purified, so it's quantum. And indeed, as this, this U became more and more scrambling, we were able to show the teleportation worked better and better. There's noise and errors, and that's why it didn't go all the way to 100%. Now, recently, this circuit was, was, uh, <clears throat> was pointed out by folks at Google X and Stanford, Caltech, Princeton, and my colleague Brian Swingle at Maryland to, uh, to actually extend this by doing more tests and, uh, and, and ma making a connection between these, these uh, ideas of entanglement and wormholes. So, yeah, I wanted to point that out because the physics coming out of this has, is so far removed from my experience that it makes it super fun. So um, I want to point out also that uh, that lab I showed you before, without much exaggeration, has been shrunk and simplified into a real system. In fact, this system is much more powerful than that lab I showed you before. This, will, this, this has a template of about 32 qubits, which is still small. Two to the 32 is about, is about a billion. So that's still not big enough. But when we get to 100 qubits, that's going to be uh, too big to be able to model any other way. So we're getting there. And I'll point out that this, this, um, this experiment is at the university. It was funded by IARPA. Um, and and th this merits a few remarks. IARPA is the uh, DARPA of the intelligence community. Um, and they're, 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 they sort of do research that's of relevance to all of the intelligence agency from NSA, CIA, and so forth. They're very interested in quantum computing for obvious reasons, but this is open research. And in fact, I, I would say the IARPA program in quantum computing is the biggest open program in the world, and it has been for many years. It affords us the ability to make systems like this, and we collaborate with Sandia National Lab that makes the silicon chip that supports these atoms. There's 80 ytterbium atoms floating above this chip, about a tenth of a millimeter. And other companies, we're integrators. We, we, uh, we tell them, we love your product, could you do it this way? It's very expensive. IARPA pays them to do that, and we integrate it in our systems. I'll also point out that IARPA, of, their, of this largest program in the world, half of the funding goes abroad to two teams in Europe, actually. But they're funding anybody. They don't care. I often, uh, I often get a little annoyed at that, but I sort of get it. I get the bottom line. <laughs> um, but this should be, I, I would like this to be spread out a little more, that, that US, even the intelligence agencies fund uh, science abroad in a very big way. Now, uh, I mentioned INQ at the beginning, and this technology that's inside that box, um, it, it, it's the basis for systems we've built down the road at INQ. It's about a half a mile away from my lab. It's off campus, um, and uh, I think I said there are about 100 employees there now. We've built four full-stack quantum computer systems rather quietly, not secretly, but, but you know, we're, not, we're, we're, we're busy heads down building these things. Um, and yeah, sorry, the pictures are so dark here, but there's not much to see. It looks a lot like this box. What you can't see is the software and the FPGA engineering all homegrown at INQ to control these things. That's where the entirety of our challenge is. It's not the quantum bit, the quantum bit's done. We'll never improve it, because these are atomic clocks, way better than we need them to be. It's all about the control of them, from the chip itself, the electrodes underneath it, and the lasers that, that push these atoms around. This is an example of the control we have. At INQ, we have a, 
uh, a, a camera that images each ion as it's being loaded. This is a real time. We load from one side of the chip and then we merge them in with the atoms that are already there. And we wanted 24, exactly 24. And with an 80% probability, each time we do get one. But we can count how many there are. They're in a zigzag. We straighten out the chain with, by modifying the electrodes, refocus the, the lens, now ready to go. Now we can do an algorithm. And we have 32 beams that are aimed on each of these ions. Um, for this one, we only needed 24. It's totally reconfigurable. There are no wires here. There's lots of wires over here, but there are none near the quantum system. That's really important. If you have wires near your quantum bit, you're dead, because now you're doing solid state physics, and you can't replicate that stuff. Our wires, our wires are laser beams. Now, laser beams are also noisy, so we're in the business of making very clean laser beams. We're not using much fiber optics yet, but that's in our future. We're not integrating optics on the silicon chip. That's in the future. We have a ton of technology trains that we're going to bring into this. And that's why I say when the big companies get into this technology, then you should uh, start to pay attention. OK, so I'm going to skip over a few slides really fast. And note that uh, I would say 2020 will be an interesting year. Uh, I don't, we probably won't find the killer app of optimization, but uh, two very big cloud providers, Microsoft Azure and, and AWS, have uh, announced that they're going to offer anybody that subscribes to their services access to hardware on the cloud. Um, and Microsoft is using these three types of hardware. QCI is a startup in Yale, based uh, Rob Sholkoff's company, based on superconducting qubits. IonQ and Honeywell are based on trapped ion qubits. Uh, very briefly, you know, I've sent eight or nine of my students to Honeywell uh, outside of Boulder. And they have a team, uh, I think it's up to 100 or so. Um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it, it's talk about competition. It's, it, it's great that they're doing this because it sort of validates us. We're just a startup, and they're a huge corporation. Um, they were very secretive uh, for a while on what they're doing uh, for actually very innocent reasons. And they're, they're now much more open. They go to conferences. So um, it's, it's actually a, a very nice situation, I would say. Um, uh, AWS uh, has our system and also a couple of superconducting systems that they can, they can put on their cloud. So if you don't, you, you know, you, you shouldn't, as our CEO at INQ says, you shouldn't believe any of us when we're talking selling qubits. Use them. Test them out, even on very small circuits. And, and uh, you know, I, th I think the, year, the next year or two, it'll be very interesting to, to see what happens. You know, hope maybe somebody will... Uh, hit a home run on the algorithm side, and even though it's a small system, they'll say, well, you know, when you scale this to 500 qubits, you know, this is going to be very important. But it's, it's super critical that people use these machines, and computer scientists start to apply some of their, you know, some of their tricks in compiling and so forth. I mean, we're, we're programming not in a language, really. It's more at a gate level. It's very primitive. It's not even assembly language yet. Um, so we really need those developers to, to start to use these things and tell us how to build the next generation. Um, okay, so I want, I want to step back and, and talk a little more maybe internationally about this field. I think it's attracted the interest of pretty much every major country with a research budget um, for many reasons I think I alluded to. Um, it, it's super promising, both commercially and for security. And, and I'll, I'll say it again, I think the security aspects are you know, very long run, a little bit overstated. Um, I think the more interesting thing is uh, the economic security of some of these potential algorithms, how they will help companies optimize things. Uh, and, and of course, governments and, and departments of defense are very interested in, in using them for optimization programs of all different types. So this slide, I apologize, it's a little outdated. Uh, and you'll, uh, you, you can tell where it came from. I think it came from The Economist um, uh, uh, through McKinsey. Um, but, um, Peter Knight is here, and I would say the UK was really the first nation in the world nationally to put together an initiative. Uh, and it really made waves across the world. And that was in, what, 2014 or 2013, yeah. Um, in the EU as a whole, the individual countries have some outsized investments, Austria, Denmark, the Netherlands. Um, and again, th these numbers are really outdated. Uh, uh, China, of, of course, has, a, has a, a big program in quantum information they have for many years. They've, as, as like everything, they have a very steep slope. And we've heard numbers uh, ranging from a few billion to a few ten billion on their investment in, in the coming decade. Not sure exactly what that number is, but it's a very serious effort they have there. Um, and the European Union, following on the lead from London, 
uh, has a flagship program, one of their very few scientific initiatives that are continent-wide on quantum information that will double down more than that on, on the individual um, investments from the countries. Um, the, the U.S. Um, only is a little bit of a late uh, uh, starter in the idea of a quantum initiative. Part of this is fitting because in the U.S. we have so many different agencies with different missions that um, it might seem that we're very disorganized from that perspective. On the other hand, all the missions know what they want to do. Nevertheless, there should be coordination. I mean, the defense and the intelligence agencies have really uh, taken control of this field in the U.S. since the 90s. Um, and they continue to really have the, the, uh, you know, the control of this field. But because I think the interest in the field's moved a little bit from security to commerce and general algorithms, it makes sense that the civilian agencies like DOE, NSF, NIST, who has always been there, uh, that they start to, start to coordinate their, their efforts here. And so the National Quantum Initiative, uh, because I'm trapped inside the Beltway in my workplace, I ended up playing a big role in, in, in helping, uh, helping the government uh, formulate the, the idea of a National Quantum Initiative. And uh, it was passed in, uh, uh, a little over a year ago. It's an authorization bill. There are dollar figures in that bill, but it's only authorization. So the agencies are rightfully a little nervous about what that means. But um, I'm happy to say over the last, over the intervening time, all the agencies are really, uh, are really going after this internally. And we totally expect appropriations. They've already started uh, for the agencies. And I'll also say, without spending a nickel, the National Quantum Initiative has given impetus for almost every university to spin up their own effort, usually from the physics department. Uh, often it's more broad, and I think it should be. But these universities are coming up with their own, they're, they're, they're redoubling their efforts on hiring people in the field. Students are coming to it. Um, so so uh, it, it's already had an effect, uh, an immeasurable effect in terms of dollars. Universities are hiring people. I, I think it's, it's a really good thing that this happened. And I have to put the picture of, uh, of uh, our president signing this in this late, late December of last year. And OSTP has opened an office that will sort of coordinate the activities of these agencies. And I'm happy to say that two of our own, actually from atomic physics and condensed matter physics, uh, Jake Taylor and Alex Cronin on loan from the NSF, uh, are now in OSTP helping to coordinate uh, what's going on. So yeah, I won't talk more about the NQI, but it does direct these agencies or authorize these agencies to, to go in different areas. The DOE labs in particular, because the DOE is used to having big laboratory efforts that are sort of a halfway between a university lab and industry, it makes sense for DOE labs to build these things and have some longevity, do real engineering, which is very hard to do on a, on a university campus, and I should know. Um, so I, I think I've, I've, I've said a lot. And um, for, my, for my final slide, I borrowed this cover from uh, Technology Review Magazine a few years ago. The topic was AI, I think, or blockchain. I forget what it was. But it might as well have been quantum computing. Um, there is, there is, uh, it's, it's impossible to uh, overstate the amount of hype in this field. Uh, you put the Q word behind everything, and, and it's just one of those sexy words, I guess. But I will say, it's more than just hope, there are problems out there. Remember this 2 to the 300 exponentiation. There are problems out there that will never be solved on classical computers because the universe is not big enough. Even if every atom were part of a big cosmic computer, it wouldn't be powerful enough. That doesn't mean a quantum computer can do it. But if that problem, those types of problems are ever solved, they will involve a quantum computer. That's for sure. So that's not hype. That's, that's fact. But it's also, you know, it, it may be that they aren't able to solve it. Remember that. <laughs> so anyway, that's my kind of perspective on, on, on that. And I think what's best about this field is that we, it's, it's very researchy. We don't know what this stuff's going to do. So we have to build it and see. Thanks. We have, we have plenty of time for questions, and I think I'm going to take some prerogative and ask the first one, if that's OK. Um, so, so Chris, um, you said that the field's very international. Your, your bubble chart there from McKinsey showed that China is uh, next to the US leading in, in, in size of uh, investment. So how has that Chinese interest in quantum computing uh, been affecting your work in the sense of the subject of this meeting? Hmm. So my university is a, one of the bigger programs in physics in the country, you know, very much like yours. 
And so it's very competitive for graduate students to come to Maryland. I think we get 700 applicants every year and for 35 spots or something. Um, we've noticed a little lesser the extent of, uh, of the decline in Chinese applicants, but it, it is noticeable. We see it. Um, and you know, getting, I mean, it's the usual thing. I mean, you, you'll, you'll say it as well. Uh, you know, get, getting, uh, getting very you know, top level graduate students, we cannot <laughs> just simply turn off uh, the international cooperation there. Now, as to your point about the Chinese investment internally, so I usually, I usually go to China every year on my way back from Singapore, um, mainly to see my colleague Lu Ming Duan, who is at Tsinghua University, and, and Phil and I know him very well. We recruited him to Michigan back in 2004, and he is a quiet um, uber leader in quantum information. When he was in the US, he left Michigan like two years ago because he wanted to start an experimental program and he couldn't get funding here. Uh, and unfortunately now he can't, it's very hard for him to, in practice to travel. So the only way I can see him is to go there. And the reason I have to see him is that he's, he's behind many of the things we do at a fundamental level. Just anyway, so that he, he is, he's a national treasure. It's a shame that we, we, we had to lose him. But um, in terms of the Chinese um, approach in, in quantum information as an initiative, uh, you know, we, we all read they're opening a very big uh, uh, sort of a DOE scale lab in Hefei, a, a quantum laboratory led by uh, uh, Zhang Wei Pan. Um, and they had a, a sort of a, a, a Time Magazine cover type experiment where they beamed single photons to a satellite and I think it went into Vienna and so forth and they were able to do this quantum encryption through, through satellites. Um, very expensive operation, but also maybe, you know, I, I mean, it, it was very splashy, but I'm not sure where that's going. In terms of quantum computing, um, I think they're way behind us uh, at everything I can see, notwithstanding Lu Ming Duan's effort, um, but that's a research effort. And I think uh, in this field, because the big companies in the US have gotten involved, um, they're hiring students. Students are coming into the university because they know that they're going to get many job offers from these big companies and a smattering of startups. I think that has been the savior, I think, for, for us in the U.S. But also the research enterprise, it's, it is a field that's funded very well from different agencies that have different missions. And the NSF now is rightfully grabbing onto this field uh, uh, in a more open way and in a more blue skies way as it should. Um, so, you know, I have to, you know, I hate, hate, hate to sound you know, like it's not an issue we have our eyes on, but I'm not all that concerned. <laughs> I think uh, there are very few leaders uh, in this field in China, and I, want, I know I'm being recorded here, so. <laughs> <laughs> I listed them. I listed them. Charlie, do you have a question? I guess you heard it. It's an anti de Sitter space, so that then. Other questions? Thank you. Sorry if this is a stupid question, but <laughs> your, I, I don't understand exactly what your qubit is. I mean, I tend to think of like, you know, flipping a spin or something, but you said it's an atomic clock. Yeah. How do you get a qubit out of a tom an atomic clock? Oh, yeah, thank, thank you. I, <laughs> I should have maybe at the outset mentioned that. So an atomic clock is a two-level system. And uh, 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 the energy separation between those two levels divided by Planck's constant is a frequency. So if you have a two-level system, you can define a frequency. Um, and if that's a very stable frequency, it can be a standard. And these, uh, you can call it an effective spin if you want. Each of these atoms has a nuclear spin and an electron spin, and they couple, there's a hyperfine interaction. So these are two, two levels, they're hyperfine levels. Uh, in, in the ytterbium ion, I didn't even say ytterbium, um, the, the splitting is 12.6 gigahertz, and I could list about eight more numbers because we know exactly what it is. It's perfectly replicable. And you're it, not, you're not uh, spinning it in the one state or the other state. Right, it, 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 it's a microwave transition, so the, even though the, the, the true ground state is one of those levels, we have an excited state. You might say, well, that's going to relax. It takes 10,000 years for that to relax. So it's very stable. Um, and we can prepare a superposition using NMR techniques, basically. We use optics to do this, optical beat note that's precisely matched to this hyperfine splitting. So there, uh, it's a very mature 
technology to control these types of atomic spins. Now, what I didn't say also, these are ions. That's why they're forming a crystal. Um, and when we, when we push on one of them with a laser beam, they all know about it. And that's how we can hook them up without wires. <laughs> there's, there's electrical, there's a Coulomb interaction. So in a sense, that's a wire. But there's no solid state material anywhere, except many, really far away that, that can find these electrodes, that can find them. Mitch Ambrose from the American Institute of Physics. I'm curious what advice you'd give to anyone else from a different subdiscipline in the room who would want to go to Congress trying to advocate for the national, you know, insert the blank here initiative. You know, how, can you just reflect on the, that process and how, you know, following the authorization through following up with the appropriation and, 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 and what advice you'd give to others? Yeah, I remember Phil, Phil called me one time and said, how did this happen? I mean, it's so fast. Well, you know, when I, I, moved, I moved to the area from Michigan in 2007, I, I think I'd been here two years, and in the, in the capital, they had just renovated the atrium area on the east side uh, of the capital, and, you know, they have the old flag there and so forth. And I took, we, we, we'd come down a couple times a year, the whole group, to just goof around in the mall and, and have dinner. And the whole research group came into this new atrium, and they had congressional staffers that were touring everybody. And we had a big group, and we had a staffer that was helping us along, and, and he asked me, so where are you from? I said, oh, we're just from up the road in College Park. Oh, what do you guys do? Well, we, we do quantum computing. And he said, oh, yeah, I've heard of that. Um, yeah, we, we hear that on the Hill all the time, but nobody does anything about it. <laughs> that's, what, that's what he said, and that was 2008. So um, probably through the intelligence agency's interest and the idea that, that security could become uh, an issue if we have big quantum computers. It, it's captured the attention of many, many on the Hill. And so they all know about it. Um, and again, I think that might be, I mean, it was a good catalyst to get things going. I think maybe that's not going to be the killer app uh, in these fields. But they know about it. They also know that, uh, they know what Moore's Law is. They know it's ending. They know that, uh, you know, uh, a lot of the, uh, the staffers, many of them are just science experts. They, you know, that's what they're, that's why they're hired by. Uh, the, the, the member of Congress uh, to, to advise them on science and technology. And they know that, you know, in, Intel Corporation, for instance, you know, 30 years ago, they knew exactly what they were going to do in 10 years. They, they could plan how small the system was going to get. They're not doing that now. They have no idea where they're going to be in 20 years on uh, that Moore's Law curve. It's getting, uh, for the first time ever, I think a few years ago, it cost more per transistor uh, to build it. Uh, when they got below, I think, about eight or nine nanometers. So um, this is an economic issue. If we want to enjoy the economic growth we've had over the last six or seven years, we have to be on top of different modes of computing. Quantum is one of them. It's not the only one. So I think that's the reason the appetite was there for many years. And I think because it's been in the research field for over 20 years, um, the time is right. Companies are starting to play ball. They're starting to make their own investments. And, and I, I had a slide with uh, some of our partners that helped us do this. You'll, you'll recognize lots of big companies here um, that, helped, um, that helped these congressional uh, uh, committees uh, see the importance of this. And I'll also say as well that the, the, um, the National Photonics Initiative, which, is, which was stewarded by the Optical Society of America and SPIE, had a big hand in this. They have a professional lobby team. And you know, these lobbyists, I guess, I know I'm on camera, I'll say it anyway. You know, lobbyists are a little like criminal lawyers. <laughs> you know, they, they have this tinge of, uh, well, I won't say the word. But when you need one, they're really good. <laughs> I mean, they know how the place works. So I have a newfound respect for lobbyists. I mean, they know who's doing what, who's interested in this. I mean, that's imp very important. They, they, get, uh, they get a bad rap in the press. But having access, pretty much full, unfettered access to a team of professional lobbyists, that was key. And that was, again, the National Photonics Initiative and the OSA. Uh, the NPI was a National Academy uh, initiative that was funded many years ago. And Mike Raymer and I kind of took them aside. You know, you might steer them onto quantum. And they totally agreed and bought into it. So that's all those things, I think, made for the, you know, the right time.
Uh, I'm Sig Hecker from Stanford and uh, formerly Los Alamos. Uh, so I'm, uh, first of all, fascinating talk. I'm curious about what you foresee as the interplay between the applications and the machines. Because if you, if you look back at the history uh, of classical computing, uh, and particularly uh, supercomputing, you know, as we call it now, is uh, all the way from the ENIAC that you showed, or the MANIAC, you know, at Los Alamos, you didn't show that. The MANIAC, the ENIAC stretch, and then the Cray machines. Uh, it was essentially the nuclear weapons laboratory, Los Alamos, Lawrence Livermore, uh, that drove uh, the development of those computers because they had problems that were big enough that required those computers and then they had people who knew how to use them. In other words, how to write the software. You know, Seymour Cray came to Los Alamos in 1976, and he said, hey, I've got this big machine, but I don't know what to do with it. You know, can you guys help? And so we essentially helped to write uh, what it took. Uh, and then, of course, it went from there and started to spread out more with the connection machines and massively parallel processing. Uh, but these laboratories still played a very big role and the application then pull the computers. So what do you foresee for this area? You know, you mentioned optimization and of course encryption and so forth, but I can't quite envision uh, as to how uh, this, co you know, this cooperation between the users and the machine people is gonna pull this forward. Great, great question. Um, I think it's a real challenge on the one hand because these are not just a new generation of devices we're used to. Even the Cray was based on classical technology. It was a Turing machine. Um, the rules required to program these things, some people just disregard them. You know, I deal with this at academic engineering departments. They, you know, they say, oh, you, you physicists, that quantum mumbo jumbo, that's never gonna play a role. But we need, badly need engineers, not just to build them, but computer scientists to, to uh, help us understand how to, uh, how to write programs in them. Like I said, we're not even at assembly code language. Um, and this has, been, this has been a challenge. NSF has been on top of the game on computer science. They've really tried to stimulate academic departments for hiring. They even have a program that will f pay startup and maybe salary for a few years for new computer science hires in quantum. But, um, you know, actually my daughter is a computer scientist major at Maryland. They're one of the fastest growing computer science departments in the world. They have to hire six or seven new faculty every year because they lose three, uh, and the growth, it's, it's, it's incredible. They can't afford to hire a quantum computer scientist because they have to, I, I understand those pressures. Um, but it's not just gonna be on the academic side. Like you say, national laboratories have problems that are hard. Um, and I, I totally buy what you're saying that we're not going to find a use case without developing machines and learning how to build them. These are not a commodity. You can't, I mean, we take, we routinely take 10 megabyte pictures on our cell phones these days because memory's cheap, it's a commodity. Um, you couldn't imagine that 30, even 30 years ago. So qubits are not a commodity, gates are not a commodity. We need to co-design at the very bottom level, at the atomic physics level, we need to be able to understand algorithms. And that's something, I mean, some of us are trying to reach up the stack, the people in computer science are trying to reach down, but it's like an ASIC, an application specific IC that uh, a Cray, I, don't, I actually should know more about the Cray machine, but I know that you know, my sister is a computer scientist at Los Alamos, works on turbulence and so forth. Um, and she's interested in probabilistic computing, which is another form of computing. And again, they have to co-design. I took that term from her and I use it to qu on quantum all the time. We have to co-design our machines to the applications. And we have no idea what those applications are. And so it's a big bet to have a startup. Well, actually it's not my money, it's venture capital money. They're making the big bet. Um, that, that we're actually going to stumble upon something. But it won't be us, it's gonna be users that tell us how to build the next generation and wire it in just such a way that we can, we can you know, wring out every ounce of efficiency, because we have to, they're not a commodity, we can't waste anything. We can't waste memory, we can't waste qubits and so forth. So I, I'm not sure I really answered it very well, but I sort of agree, this optimization stuff, um, I think everything turns out to be an optimization, but you have to really dig into the particular application and see what hardware works, what type of a gate set. There are different gates. We don't use the NAND. The NAND is universal in classical computing because it's so easy to wire together. We have a variety of different gates at the quantum world that depend on the hardware, but they should depend on the algorithm too. So, yeah, thank you for that. I, I was able to say lots of things I wanted to put in my talk. <laughs>
very much, Chris. Uh, so we'll, we'll now I'll go to a coffee break and be back in 30 minutes for the panel discussion on uh, international engagement in competitive physics fields. Thank you. Oh, that's fun. Hi, David. Thank you.